It is wonderful what the principle of selection by man, that is, the picking out of individuals with any desired quality and breeding from them, and again picking out, can do. Even breeders have been astounded at their own results. They can act on differences inappreciably to an uneducated eye. Selection has been methodically followed in Europe for only the last half century, but it was occasionally, and even in some degree methodically, followed in the most ancient times. There must have been also a kind of unconscious selection from a remote period, namely in the preservation of the individual animals, without any thought of their offspring most useful to each race of man in his particular circumstances. The roguing, as nurserymen call the destroying of varieties which depart from their type, is a kind of selection. I'm convinced that intentional and occasional selection has been the main agent in the production of our domestic races. But, however this may be, its great power of modification has been indisputably shown in later times. Selection acts only by the accumulation of slight or greater variations caused by external conditions or by the mere fact that in generation the child is not absolutely similar to its parent. Man, by this power of accumulating variations, adapts living beings to his wants may be said to make the wool of one sheep good for carpets, of another for cloth, etc. Now suppose there were a being who did not judge by mere external appearances, but who could study the whole internal organization, who was never capricious and should go on selecting for one object during millions of generations, who will say what he might not affect. In nature, we have some slight variation occasionally in all parts, and I think it can be shown that changed conditions of existence is the main cause of the child not exactly resembling its parents. And in nature, geology shows us what changes have taken place and are taking place. We have almost unlimited time, but one but a practical geologist can fully appreciate this. Think of the glacial period, during the whole of which the same species at least of shells have existed. There must have been during this period millions on millions of generations. I think it can be shown that there is such an unerring power at work in natural selection, the title of my book which selects exclusively for the good of each organic being. The elder, de Candolet, W. Herbert, and Lyell have written excellently on the struggle for life, but even they have not written strongly enough. Reflect that every being, even the elephant, breeds at such a rate that in a few years or at most a few centuries the surface of the earth would not hold the progeny of one pair. I have found it hard constantly to bear in mind that the increase of every single species is checked during some part of its life or during some shortly recurrent generation. Only a few of those annually born can live to propagate their kind. What a trifling difference must often determine which shall survive and which shall perish. Now take the case of a country undergoing some change. This will tend to cause some of its inhabitants to vary slightly. Not but that I believe most beings vary at all times enough for selection to act on them. Some of its inhabitants will be exterminated and the remainder will be exposed to the mutual action of a different set of inhabitants which I believe to be far more important to the life of each being than mere climate. Considering the infinitely various methods which living beings follow to obtain food by struggling with other organisms, to escape danger at various times of life, to have their eggs or seeds disseminated. I cannot doubt that during millions of generations, individuals of a species will be occasionally born with some slight variation, profitable to some part of their economy. Such individuals will have a better chance of surviving. 
and of propagating their new and slightly different structure, and the modification may be slowly increased by the accumulative action of natural selection to any profitable extent. The variety thus formed will either coexist with, or more commonly, will exterminate its parent form. An organic being, like the woodpecker or mistletoe, may thus come to be adapted to a score of contingencies. Natural selection, accumulating those slight variations in all parts of its structure which are in any way useful to it during any parts of its life. Multiform difficulties will occur to everyone with respect to this theory. Many can, I think, be satisfactorily answered. Natura non facet saltum answers some of the most obvious. The slowness of the change, and only a very few individuals undergoing change at any one time, answers others. The extreme imperfections of our geological record answers others. Another principle, which may be called the principle of divergence, plays, I believe, an important part in the origin of species. The same spot will support more life if occupied by very diverse forms. We see this in the many generic forms in a square yard of turf and in the plants or insects in any little uniform islet, belonging almost invariably to as many genera and families as species. We can understand the meaning of this fact amongst the higher animals whose habits we understand. We know it has been experimentally shown that a plot of land will yield a greater weight if sown with several species and genera of grasses than if sown with only two or three species. Now every organic being, by propagating so rapidly, may be said to be striving its utmost to increase in numbers. So it will be with the offspring of any species, after it has become diversified into varieties or subspecies or true species. And it follows, I think, from the foregoing facts that the varying offspring of each species will try, only a few will succeed, to seize on as many and as diverse places in the economy of nature as possible. Each new variety or species, when formed, will generally take the place of, and thus exterminate, its less well-fitted parent. This I believe to be the origin of the classification and affinities of organic beings at all times. For organic beings always seem to branch and sub-branch like the limbs of a tree from a common trunk, the flourishing and diverging twigs destroying the less vigorous, the dead and lost branches rudely representing extinct genera and families. This sketch is most imperfect, but in so short a space I cannot make it better. Your imagination must fill up very wide blanks. See Darwin.